Hello, I'm Doug Musio. This is City Talk. Stop and frisk, broken windows, the SAFE Act, Bratt and Kelly Cuomo, chokeholds, crime hotspots, smartphone theft. Joining me to talk New York City policing and crime, New York State law, gun control, and more is Richard Aborn, president of the Citizens Crime Commission. The commission is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization focused on criminal justice and public safety and practices. Mr. Aborn also serves as president of Constantine and Aborn Advisory Services, which advises police departments, criminal justice agencies, and corporations in the U.S., Europe, and Latin America on high-level strategy and management. Welcome, Richard. Thank you. Okay. Here. There's lots to talk about, and the, the commission really has a huge agenda. Let me just read from your website. Cybercrime, domestic terrorism, gang and group violence prevention, large capacity ammunition magazines, mass shooting incidents, raise the age to 18, counterterrorism, DNA data bank, guns equal prison, interstate strikes force, juvenile dust justice, and micro stamping. That's a lot. There's always a lot going on in the criminal justice world. Okay, talk about the CCC. Give me a little bit of brief history and why you're where you are. So it's actually quite interesting, and I'm sure none of your viewers know this. We actually trace ourselves back to the time when the NYPD was founded. There was a minister, a local minister, who worked out of one of the churches by Trinity Church, who took on corruption and vice in, hey. the, in the late 1800s. Sound familiar? Hey, come on. It, it was brothels, it was drinking, and it was police corruption. And he hooked up with a then somewhat obscure individual by the name of Teddy Roosevelt, who was one of the one of the board, one of the members of the board of police commission. Right. We did not have a police commission back right. then. And that was really the roots of the founding of the Citizens Crime Commission. And we've, been, we've waxed and waned over the years, depending on what's going on in town. And in our current incarnation, we start probably in the mid-80s and have been very active ever since then. Okay, let's talk about, you've, you've got a, obviously a big agenda. Yes. Let's focus on three. New York City crime, the NYPD, and policing. And the real surprise to me was smartphone theft. So talk about each one of those. Crime. Sure. What's the picture right now? It's October 2014. What did the data look like? So the data is really quite good. Um, remarkably, we have continued to see declines in crime. The NYPD is doing just an outstanding job. There are cops out there every day enforcing the law, and they are continuing to make the streets safer and safer and safer. The job's not done. The job's not done but we have a ways to go. We're actually on track. If, if the numbers just hold steady, we will have the lowest number of murders in this city in anybody's memory. Unbelievable. And that's not only murders, but it's Every category. All, all the yeah. categories. Yeah, we have one, we just, just a- Go ahead. Oh, we have one, one issue area, which is our shootings are up in some areas, um, somewhat slightly. They're coming off a record low year. Right. But they're up, and the department's got to get them down, and they're working on that. Yeah, you, uh, you were on a show with Errol Lewis on, yeah. on Inside City Hall talking about that there are violent hot spots right. in the city. And so when you look at the macro numbers, the aggregate numbers, it real, looks really, really correct. good. But if you yeah. live in certain parts of, for example, central Brooklyn, it ain't, it ain't, Th it that's ain't correct. so sweet. That's correct. What, what can the PD do and what is the PD doing? So they're doing a, a number of things. First, you've got to pull the, the problem apart a little bit. Um, the problem is not stranger rapes, robberies, assaults, murders. Mm. It's, it's events between people that tend to know each other. It's a lot of gang and crew activity, which are essentially kids who get into turf wars over, frankly, unnecessary boundaries. It's from different At housing At least from your perspective. From our perspective. perspective. From my, right. Perspective. Uh, they are from different housing developments, and they get into these turf wars, and they often end up shootings. Now, with shootings, you get innocent bystanders to get hit. All kinds so of that's, that's a huge problem. What can the department do? The department is doing a number of things. First of all, the city council, quite light, wisely in my mind, gave them a lot of money to put cops, more cops on the street with overtime, and they also reached deep within the department to figure out which officers they could put on the street yep. 
as opposed to keeping them in, in clerical or office jobs. Right. Um, that's had a big impact over the summer. That money's starting to trail off a little bit now, so I wish the council would give them some more money so they could maintain those staffing levels. The department, the mayor, and the council are looking at adding a thousand new cops. I think that's a good mm -hmm. idea. We called for it for quite a while ago. I wish they would go ahead and do that. But the other thing they're doing, which is really, really smart, is they are, they are really zeroing in on who the problem actors are and trying to work with them in a prevention way. You know, the big shift in policing now is getting more and more towards prevention. Right. Because it's root calling. Sure. And that's a big, big deal. And the department's starting to do that even with very violent offenders and with these crew members and with these gang members. And that's starting to pay off. We, there's an interesting program called JRIP, Juvenile Robbery Intervention Program, which has been tried, um, I guess it's two or three years now. And that's having remarkable results. And that's a lot of one-on-one -on -one interaction between the cops and the potential offenders. Okay, okay. Let's, let's, let's talk about cop culture. Let's talk about Bratton. Let's talk about Kelly. There seems to be a really significant cultural shift in the PD from the Kelly to the Bratton and also some really organizational changes. Talk about the, the, the differences between the two commissioners. I guess what you just talked about, you know, the Kelly approach of Project Impact, flooding neighborhoods with basically rookie cops. And brand what, new cops, right. Brand new cops. Right. And Bratton's more, so almost community policing plus Comstat type of approach. Talk about Bratton, talk about Kelly and, and, and in terms of policing and its impacts. Sure. So um, Commissioner Kelly had a remarkable tenure. Um, he, he was there 12 years, and I, I don't think he had a single year in which crime went up. Maybe there was one. But his trends were all downward virtually in every single category. Mm -hmm. Truly remarkable. In fact, everybody thought we had bottomed out. But Bratton Constantly. Is, yeah, we, we constantly think that. Bratton has shown you can take it lower. There are differences in their management style. Um, Kelly, I think, probably concentrated more power in one police plaza and probably made more decisions from one police plaza than Bratton does. Bratton has, has long been an advocate of driving power out sure. into the precinct commands, but holding them accountable, hence the Comstat right. process. So I think that's a pretty significant change in the culture. The other change is that you're right. Um, Ray Kelly always talked about community policing, to be sure, and he was out in the community all the time. Bratton is really pushing rebuilding relationships mm -hmm. with the community. I mean, let's be honest. Stop and frisk got a little bit out of control, and it drove away some of the communities. Bratton is there to repair that, and he's in the midst of doing that. Talk about stop and frisk. The, the, the number of stops and frisks are almost min minuscule compared yeah. to what they were, and there does not seem yet, and it may be too soon, to see any blip in, you know, real blip in the crime numbers, except maybe in some of these precincts that are hot spots, but you, you've done it, what is it, 1% of the stops? Right, and so, yeah, and, there, and there's, there is no data correlation, at least that I'm aware of, nor from what we looked at, between stop and frisk and these great reductions in crime. What we have seen is because of the mayoral race and the court order in particular, that Bratton has continued a trend that Kelly stopped, but he accelerated it, and he's brought the number of stops way, 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 way down. In fact, the, there's a federal court monitor that will go into effect at some point. He used to monitor stop and frisk. If stops and frisk keep going down, he'll, you be, able the, you he'll be able to monitor every single one of them. Right. You, be so few. You, you, will, you will eliminate the problem. And, but what's remarkable is that, is that it, we have a fraction of this, I mean, a, a tenth of a fraction of the stops that we had last year and the year before, and crime has continued to go down, defying all the expectations. Everybody's out there saying the city's going to fall apart, it's going to become ultra violent. Just the opposite has happened. We've almost eliminated stop and frisk, turned it into a very effective tool. Crime continues to go down, and there are reasons for that. Go ahead. Well, so, other than, I mean, but it's not, I mean, excuse my, my professorial language, it's not monocausal. It's certainly not only precisely. police behavior. Precisely. There's got to be other causal factors involved. What are, something else is going on. So to, I don't want to be equally professorial, but, I, but, oh, as, you, but yes, as, as you know. Please do. But I mean, come on. <laughs> as you know, cause and effect in the social sciences is very, very, very difficult Excuse me. to determine. Yes. It's incredibly difficult. So I'm always hesitant to say that A cause B, because it's not always a direct line. Sure. But the macro level data shows rapid changes in crime levels depending on police behavior. We're seeing that now with stop and frisk. And the reason beyond just the cops' presence is that there's a greater legitimacy beginning to develop 
between the police and the community. The community is starting to trust the cops again. They're starting to rebuild that relationship. That raises the authority of the cops, so you shift from power to authority, and you also raise compliance levels, and you raise cooperation with the cops. All of those things equal public safety. Yeah, see, I mean, that, I, I did a project many years ago with the PD on uh, cultural competency, and that was it. Basically, the, the, the issue was respect exactly. and, and knowledge exactly. by both communities, the communities, yeah. the, the racial, ethnic, et cetera, community, socioeconomic communities, but also the cop community. Yeah, you're and, exactly right. And, and that, that was a major problem, the lack of communication, but the desire on the part of the PD to do it. But what, what else is going on besides policing? So, well... Let, let me just complete the policing piece. And, go, and, and go, the, go. The other thing that Bratton Stubb, which I think is really smart, is he is no longer flooding the impact. They're still impact zones, but they're no longer flooding the impact zones with just rookies. They're now linking them with much more experienced cops, and they're Mentoring linking works. them sure. with community leaders. Yep. They're linking them with community leaders. So in order to improve police-community relations, it, it's a binary, right? Yep. Each side has to move. Yep. So the, the community is moving close to the cops, and the cops are moving close to the community. And that's really helping. The other thing that's happening is New York is incredibly fortunate in having a very robust sort of ring around the cops and the prosecutors and courts of not-for-profit organizations yep. that spend their entire existence working on the crime issue, whether it's recidivism, groups working on reentry, or whether it's pre-entry, groups working on stopping kids from getting into crime, or whether it's working with people who have been arrested and trying to de uh, deter them yep. from courts. All of these things are going on around the system, and this mayor is, is really quite invested in thinking about different ways to drive down crime besides just policing. Policing has to be the core. No community can be safe without a strong police department, and we have a strong police department. But you have to surround it with other things, and that's what's going on here. Yeah, but then you get a, you know, the Garner case. You've got a, a chokehold response uh, that suggests that all is not well out there. And obviously, we, we're not Ferguson in terms of what happened in reaction. But there, clearly, the, there is a need for improvement, but also in terms of training and other things as well. There's got to be organizational as well as cultural changes at the PD. To be sure, all is not rosy, for sure. We clearly have a problem with cops who can't keep their hands in their pockets. They're hitting too many people too quickly with zero provocation, and they're not always doing it in self-defense, and it has to stop. It has to stop. It's just going too far now. The, the commissioner has been outspoken about saying we've got to get rid of these bad apples, and, and this is not one or two. Right. They're, they're a clear lot. They're not hundreds by any means, right. but they're out there, and there's a very, very strong Deputy Commissioner of Internal Affairs in there now. They're very vigorous about this. You've got a new CCRB board. I think you're going to see a real push on police bad behavior, and that needs to be. But at the same time, you've got union leaders, and obviously they have a certain perspective and certain interest really characterizing the mayor and his behavior as being anti-cop. Respond. They, they do imply that, even if they say it. Let me say two things. First oh. of all, the unions certainly don't want the bad cops. I mean, they're very good about calling out the bad cops. Right. They will say, right. this not, they'll defend them when necessary, right. and they should. The cops are entitled to due process. But the union leaders are very good about saying, we got to get rid of the bad apples. But they're they, attacking the mayor. But, they're, but they are attacking, correct, they are attacking the mayor. Um, listen, let's be honest, the mayor ran on stop and frisk. It right. was read by everybody as anti-cop. Right. I don't think Mayor de Blasio is anti-cop by any means. I think he was anti-stop and frisk. He was right. We've reformed that now. We're pushing it forward. But it takes a while to repair these cultural divides. I hope the mayor continues to be outspoken about supporting the department and, ex and actually, more importantly, supporting the cops on the street. Right. They're the ones that have to get the message. I, I think the most important thing he said was don't, don't resist arrest. I mean, in part, just very practical, you know, uh, advice. Sure. But let's be honest. Somebody resisting arrest is not a license to beat them up. Oh, you know, oh excuse me. Yeah, you've got to you've gotta learn how to yep. handle somebody yep. who's resisting arrest. There are lots of resists that take place in this town every day. They don't all result in beatings. And Commissioner Bratton, to his credit, in fact, it's starting very soon, is, is said he's going to retrain the entire department. Yep. So we want to, I'm going to borrow a phrase from a friend of mine, but we want to shift from takedowns, which is pulling the person down, 
to talk downs, where you give the cops the verbal skills to start diffusing some of these situations. In this project that I worked with in, in, in the late 90s, early 2000s, I saw cops, we used to ride around in the back of cars, mm -hmm. constantly diffuse potential violent situations or arrest situations by talking to the perpetrators. Absolutely, absolutely. Dozens of times. Absolutely. Oh, you're, in London, you're in London a lot, the, and I do, I do a lot of work in London with, with policing agencies there. The cops there are very skilled at talking their way yep. out of these situations. Yep. They don't have a gun. Yep. They govern by what they call the consent of the government. They get their authority from the people. Yep. And they really internalize that. So it's a, it's a different relationship. We need to borrow some of that and bring it here. Okay. Let's talk about gun control. You've been personally a longtime advocate. Bratton has certainly been a longtime gun control advocate. What is with this, this high... Uh, Volume magazines. Why aren't they? It's it's. Why aren't they banned? Yeah, I mean they clearly, were. They were. Yeah, right. But they're not. No. So actually, I met Commissioner Bratton working on gun control. I was leading the national gun control movement. Right. And, and Commissioner Bratton started coming to Washington to work with us. And he was there before the issue got popular, and he's been there every day yeah. since. He's, yeah. He's terrific. Yeah. He's terrific. He's terrific on this. So here's the lay of the land. Um, it, when President Clinton was in his second year in office, we passed the the crime control bill, right. which put 100,000 cops on the street. We're getting 20 years of that now. And it also banned assault weapons and it banned large capacity magazines. Ban them. Go yes, on. yes. Done. Thank you. When we first started working on those two bills, the large capacity magazine bill that we wrote had six rounds in it. It allowed six rounds. And the reason was, and it almost seems quaint now, the cops were carrying six shot revolvers. Well, we thought, well, that's plenty of rounds. Through some machinations that took place in the Senate, it got raised to 10, and we were able to ban them at 10. We passed the right. legislation. Unfortunately, we had to make a political compromise, which in retrospect didn't work, which said that the bill would be reevaluated in 10 years, and if, the, and if the Congress didn't renew it, it would automatically sunset. Revert, right. Our calculation was in 10 years, this would be a thing of the past. Yep. Well, the Republicans were in control, President Bush was in the White House, and there was no way they were going to renew the ban on assault weapons and renew the ban on large capacity magazines. So do we have now? They're right back on the streets. And if you look at the recent FBI data or our study on mass shootings, yes. you'll see that mass shootings go up until the ban goes into effect. They come down during the ban's effect. Yep. They go right back yep. up because yep. people have more firepower. They have more firepower. Simple as that. And also, I, I, again, why do you need the people killers? Of they're course meant to be, and, they're and, not for and, deer or ducks. No, and and or, or turkey or geese. Yeah. But it seemed that they're meant against positions of authority: police, national guard, army. Completely. It's part of this completely. The assault crazy weapon, crazy whatever I, it is. The assault weapon is a military weapon. The Uzi was was invented by a general in the Israeli army named Uzi, General Uzi. Right, and he wanted to design a short, a short weapon carrying lots and lots of rounds. High, foul, high firepower, excuse me, for close quarters combat, because they were frequently in close quarters sure. combat. This is not a weapon you raise your shoulder, acquire a target and fire. This is for spray fire. That's what they are. We don't need those in America. We don't need those. What are the prospects now? Nil? Right now, the prospects, I think, are non-existent on banning assault weapons. There may be a little bit of hope around a compromise on a ban on large magazines, but frankly, I'm skeptical. What about at the state level? Let's go to the state. I mean, we, you know, the governor uh, had passed, or the, the, the legislature had passed, and he had signed the SAFE Act. And what, what has been the impact locally? And is there, since there's no federal ban, Talk about the SAFE Act. Sure. So uh, you said the governor passed, and actually I'm going to steal that phrase. I, I know the correction you made, but actually it was Governor Cuomo, to his credit, who came out shortly after Sandy Hook and said, we're going to do something. And he, he really <laughs> worked with the state yep. legislature yep. very, very quickly, passed a very vigorous bill, obviously only in New York, because that's the only authority sure. he has, which really helped reinforce the ban on assault weapons, lowered the number of rounds that could be carried, reinforced a large magazine, set up some registration requirements, set up some licensing requirements, and did some other things. It was a very vigorous bill. The real importance of the bill was he hoped and we hoped that it would set the national marker, that it would trigger a national debate, and that started to happen. The president got out behind some gun control bills. He put the vice president in charge. Don't forget, Vice President Biden had been chair of the Judiciary Committee right. when we passed all this yep. legislation. Yep. 
don't let anybody forget, we beat the NRA at their game three times. Yep. So they can be beat. There's yep. no question yep. about that. Unfortunately, the NRA has become incredibly potent for reasons we can talk about if you like, um, and they've been hard to push back. This election is very important. This midterm election is very important. Some of these seats may turn on the issue of guns. If that happens and we win, we're back in the game. If that happens and we lose, we're further out of the game. And the odds are the latter rather than the former. Uh, you know what? It's close. Colorado's close. That, that could be a big referendum on guns. Mm -hmm. um, there's some interesting dialogue coming out of the South. So it's a little bit too soon to know. Yeah, and also, I mean, uh, I, I lived during the summers in Delaware County and all of that upstate region, you know, it's repealed the SAFE Act. I, I, you know, it's just not a very popular bill up there. Right. And the perception is that the governor and then the president want to take away all the guns and disarm the country. In that, and that's the narrative. In that state, that's, it's more than the narrative. It's more than the narrative. Politics are composed of three things organization, money, and voter intensity. We're beginning to match the NRA on money. We're, beginning, we're getting back to where we were on organization. But right now, they have voter intensity. Why do they have voter intensity? Because of exactly what you just said, that the NRA has developed the narrative that we in the gun control movement, and now the government, want to take away everybody's guns. You want to build a national movement? Give your constituency something to lose. Think about choice. Okay. All the, right? OK. Yeah. Smartphones. I first were doing the homework for this, said, smartphone, I mean, come on, give me a break. And then as I told you, a friend of mine's in London, a guy drives by on a bike and steals his brand new iPhone 6, and the cops in London say, it's an epidemic, people are getting beaten, it's fine. You know, so we have violent crime from cell phones. Talk about smartphone theft and the efforts of the commission and, and the attorney general, in fact, to, to deal with this. So smartphone theft has just exploded in cities across America and across the UK. And the reason is, it's twofold. One, there's been an enormous amount of pressure on narcotics enforcement, so that's no longer the trade of choice for gangs and crews. It's just become too difficult to do. Smartphone thefts are easy to steal, right? And they're easy to sell in the black market. So if I steal your smartphone, good chance I can sell it for 50, so 75, So it's replacing bucks. heroin, I mean? It, it's not replacing heroin, heroin's coming No, no, out. no. But you know, narcotics trade has gone indoors now, right? Because of enforcement. Okay, I get it, I'm sorry. Because, Go of, ahead. because of enforcement. So now the, you, there's some criminality out there all the time, people make money. Come on. So they're, so they're stealing smartphones. So what we did was we hooked up with Governor, excuse me, Eric Schneiderman, Attorney General Schneiderman. You're, you're getting ahead of yourself I, I know. politically. I know. Sorry about that. Uh, Attorney General Schneiderman and the DA of San Francisco, George Gascon, right. who used to be in the LAPD yep. and is a good friend. And we got together and pressured the cell phone manufacturers to put a, what we call a kill switch into the phone so that if the phone is stolen, the phone gets zapped, if you will, to use an old term, and the phone is no longer usable. Apple has finally done that. Apple has finally done Oh, that. I know Microsoft yes. and, and, and Google had done it in response to your effort. Right. But Apple... Apple now I mean, has it. Now, once you have those three, you've pretty well locked it down. Well, you got Samsung. Samsung, That's true. Samsung is out there. And there's some other smaller ones. And the UK, and I'm sorry, I've forgotten the name of the company. But in the UK, there's another manufacturer. Okay. They all need to do it because the people who are stealing these things likely aren't going to discern which phone they're stealing. Right. When they steal so the they're phone, gonna, right. they're going to grab. So everyone needs to do it. But this is a great example and one of a continuing series of where the technology can be used to actually stop the crime issue. Ignition switch and electronic radio is the other ones. Remember sure. the signs of urban surrender? Uh, no radio? Oh, man. I, I mean, the late 70s, early 80s, right. I remember taking my kids to uh, Washington Square Park and every car had... Right. And my radio was stolen right. in Queens. Right. Okay, come right. on. Because it was an aftermarket. That's right. It was no longer an aftermarket because they're electronic now. Now, is the phone worth anything other than as a phone? I mean, are there any internal parts that it's still worth stealing or it's only as an operative phone? Well, to be open about this, the, uh -oh. the real value is not the parts, but it's what it contains. Um, there's a lot of personal data on there, and there's a lot of work data. You know, more and more people bring their own device oh, to the workplace. Oh, yeah. So if, if the bad guys figure out how to get into those phones and steal that data, that's a window into Oh, lots of okay. I, I'm, I'm just thinking of the physical no, object, no, no, but no, no. obviously we're, you're we're right. We're much more concerned about the access. Yes. The oh, data. yeah. Make, makes that's perfect why the, that's sense. That's why the kill switch is Last important. thing, DNA. Why not all the time in every case? I mean, there's I, so we, many exa exonerations. Yeah, we pushed really, really hard to keep expanding DNA. It's working extremely well. 
Um, there's one more step to go. The legislature is not going to look at it for a while. Um, it's frankly a minor step at this point. So I think it's where it needs to be. It's not only leading to lots of exonerations, but it's leading to them earlier. People are being screened out of arrest, and it's leading to a lot more convictions. So we're both catching the bad guys, the real bad guys, right. and we're exonerating those who get arrested who should not be arrested, and again, screening them earlier so they don't even get the original arrest. What, what's the situation in New York, and what's the prospects for a more thorough use of DNA. I, I guess there are civil liberties questions there, about there are very this. There are deep privacy concerns. Um, there was a lot of concern voiced that if we pass a very vigorous DNA statute, which we have, all crimes upon conviction, that there will be a lot of abuse of the DNA. So we built very strong safeguards into protecting the DNA data. And I'm very pleased to say, at least that I know of, and I'm pretty, I follow this pretty closely, okay. there's not been a single abuse of that DNA data not been given to any insurance companies, banks, hospitals. No hackers getting into the system? Not a single one that's been okay. reported, not a single one that I know of. So that, the safeguards have worked. Very serious penalties for stealing DNA data. So we're now taking DNA samples from everybody convicted of a crime. Okay. Thank you. My pleasure. That was I mean, fast. That this, was great. This, this, this was very interesting. I would recommend to everybody that you go to the website and read Mayhem Multiplied, Mass Shooters and Large Capacity Magazines. It's just, it just sends it's shivers it's down chilling. your spine. My thanks to Richard Aborn for his analysis of New York crime and New York policing. Join me next week when my guest will be City College professor Robert Paswell, affectionately and respectfully known as Buzz, when we will talk transportation, New York and around the world, here on CUNY TV. Hello, I'm Doug Musio. Let us know what you think about this show. You can reach us at cuny.tv. When you get there, click on the bar that says contact us and send your email, whatever it is. Thanks, no thanks, obnoxious, do it, send it.